can probably well, good afternoon, everyone. We're going to go ahead and get started. So uh, thank you to everyone that's here in the room. And I understand we have a few um, professional advisors and committee members that might be joining us remote uh, today as well. So again, thank you for taking time to join us for our annual market update uh, provided by Marquette and Associates. So again, welcome and thank you again for coming. Uh, my name is Kate England. I have the privilege as sir, uh, as, as serving as the CEO of the Community Foundation of Northeast Iowa. Can't talk today, I guess. Um, but it's uh, we always look forward to the opportunity to not only hear, uh, to get a good market update and to learn more about how our portfolio is helping us um, expand our grant making ability across our region, um, but also just the opportunity to pause and thank you for the important, important role that you play um, in referring uh, clients to us, uh, recommending uh, clients and, and uh, potential donors sit around the table and talk about how we can be a part of your charitable plan. Um, want to give a special shout out to Steve Widener, who's here with us today. Uh, Steve has been our legal advisor at the Community Foundation for 15, 20, 25, 30. Okay, <laughs> he started very young. He started very young. Uh, but the thank yes, <laughs> thank you. Uh, so we appreciate uh, your leadership, and and we're grateful we don't have to call on you that often, right? Next thing. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's right. But really appreciate the opportunity to work with you. Um, and then we have. I want to also recognize we have a few staff here that are in our room this morning. Um, Liz Kurt, who's our VP of Finance and Operations. Um, Jake Byers, who's our Director of Marketing Communications. Um, and then you're going to hear from um, Derek Kimball in just a minute um, as well. So um, I just want to shout out to some of our investment committee members that are here today and, and some cast members. I see too, Scott, some traveled all the way from Arizona to be a part of this. We forgot to tell you, you could do this remote, right, Scott? <laughs> yeah. No, we're glad that you're here. So we have an investment committee that's uh, a, gr a, a group of local experts um, across our counties um, that meet on a quarterly basis to uh, get updates from Dave and his team uh, about our portfolio to make decisions about how we might want to change our asset allocations to really just monitor our portfolio. And, um, and so we're going to be meeting after this meeting today. So we have several um, members that are with us and that and that are joining us uh, a little bit later. Rashonda Young is the chair of our board this year, and she also is chairing our investment committee meeting. Um, Todd Henningsen is our past chair of the board, and, and Todd's joining us virtually. Mike Hume is with us today. Uh, Matt Monahan is with us today. Pat Monet is with us today. Um, Betsy Vogel, I believe, was going to be joining us virtually. She's also on our um, committee. Uh, Jason Hassman is also on our committee um, and he's joining remotely. And then Garrett Atkins is with us uh, today as well. So again, our committee meets on a quarterly basis and we just so appreciate the dedication, the leadership, the commitment um, to help our foundation to continue to um, seek uh, good, good returns and take on the amount of risks that we should to make sure that we can carry out our grant making. Um, I want to give you a couple highlights of uh, last year for the Community Foundation, we again were just privileged to serve our region. Uh, we were able to secure a little over $11 million in new gifts to the foundation um, this past year, uh, one of which was a, a nice sizable uh, estate gift that came through a referral. Uh, 40 new funds were developed, so we're at 940 funds right now as a foundation. Um, seven new legacy gifts that <clears throat> could potentially mean over $20 million to our foundation. So again, those are those are gifts that we'll be working um, to uh, secure over the next years. And then um, most importantly, probably is our grant making. Really, we grow our assets, so we're able to do our grant making. Uh, and last year we did about eight and a half million in grants across our region. So that's how we're able to make our, um, our impacts back to our nonprofit partners. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Derek Kimball. Um, as I mentioned, Derek is new to our team and working on the charitable side of the house um, with professional advisors and with donors and nonprofit partners to um, grow resources to support the organization. So it's great to have Derek on, on staff. So yeah. turn it over to you. Okay. Yeah. All right. There you go. High five. 
<laughs> so I've been here all of uh, not quite two months. I'm going to act like I know exactly what's going on today. And, and, and like, I know all of this stuff. But I'm an ex math teacher, actually, in the area. So I'll probably find this very, very interesting. So if you have uh, folks that, that you're working with, um, I would be a good person to contact, as well as Kay uh, or Terry Gomer, our um, affiliate charitable impact director. Um, I've got cards out on the table out there if you want to grab one on the way out. Give me a shout. I uh, would love to talk about anything uh, that your potential clients are, are working on. Um, so we have a, a series of four of these events this year every few months. The next one is on April 9th, and Pat is going to uh, lead that session. If you have some uh, topics that you're interested in, in, in hearing something about, uh, let me know. That's something that that Kay and I and the team are talking about a little bit about. Is what what is uh, uh, relevant right now uh, that would you know be a good session to have uh, to talk about. So let me know if you have any ideas there. Uh, if you didn't sign in on the table uh, and you need credits for this, please make sure that you sign in before you leave. Um, and mark if you need those credits. And for the folks online, I'll send you an email. Uh, after this, if we will, I guess I should look there uh, and, and, and um, see if we need credits and I'll get you that documentation. Okay, um, right at one o'clock, we've got an investment committee meeting. Um, so we're going to try and wrap up at about 12.55. And just uh, if you've got um, conversations or if you want to talk to me or Kay or whoever, just if you just move that out, past those double doors, that would be helpful for us so we can get that investment many meetings started. Um, please feel free to grab drinks or anything else during this, and I'm excited to, to get going. So Dave Smith is Managing Director for Marquette Associates, and serves on the firm's executive committee. As an owner of the firm, Dave has been with the company since 2009, has 26 years of investment experience. He leads the healthcare uh, practice area at Marquette and is a member of the Endowments and Foundation Services Committee. Dave serves as lead investment consultant on several key client relationships. Uh, he holds several other notable positions in a variety of organizations, has a, a BS in business administration from the University of Richmond, and an MBA in finance, uh, in finance from the University of Chicago's uh, Booth School of Business. He also uh, has a hockey rink in his backyard. <laughs> I learned that he just Really, really fascinating to hear about. And he might do a dance for us. Just, we'll see. <laughs> the Cedar River dance. Cedar That's River it. dance. Yeah. Cedar That's right. Right. Yeah. Okay, welcome, Dave. Thank it you. Is. Building hockey rinks doesn't distract me from this material. That's when I get to practice my presentation. And he knows where Harry's Five and Dime and the Blue Room are in downtown Cedar Falls. I do. And I also know what it means to be with the service. That's an inside joke. I'll fill the later. More later. So, um, Kay and I were chatting just a few minutes ago about the caucuses and how the caucuses in Iowa rarely predict the actual candidate. And much like caucuses, these economic forecasts <laughs> rarely predict what's going to happen in the future. And the, uh, as evidenced by, by 2023, you know, standing here uh, last year, the expectation was recession, higher interest rates, slow growth, bear market, and that never happened. Of course, we had a great year for equity markets, bond, bonds rallied, and we avoided three consecutive years of negative return from, from core fixed income, something that has never happened. And, and this year as well, I mean, I'm sure all, you know, many of you have seen, read, heard uh, expectations, and they are all over the map from soft landing to hard landing. But in general, it does seem as though the narrative around hard landing, recession, bear market is giving way to soft landing, some growth, in equity market resiliency. And the expectation is that there will be some level of rate cuts, and we'll talk about that in just a minute. But there certainly seems to be a trend away from the world is coming to an end. Generally speaking, thinking back to the to the recessions that have occurred since 1958, uh, the average amount of time from the first rate hike to the start of a recession 
is about seven quarters. And we are right smack dab in the middle of the seventh quarter. The first rate hike occurred in March of 2022, eight quarters ago. And, you know, there's there's variability in that, but it takes a long time for this information, these actions to be digested by economies. So we're not out of the woods yet. But if we do think about you know, all of the things that have happened over the course of 2023, and there is a long list of events that no one expected, but to summarize a few, the trend in AI, the video companies, or Magnificent Seven, that created a stock market rally that really nobody expected. And that's part of the reason that we have such strong returns in equity markets. We, of course, have you know, geo geopolitical conflict in Israel and Gaza, no one expected. We are now entering the third year of conflict in Ukraine, and there doesn't seem to be any sort of path towards resolution. We've seen 11, 11 rate hikes with a pause now in July, so it's almost six months in our rearview mirror, a period of time where we had a number of different labor strikes bringing people out of the market, a number of significant events that just impact overall market volatility. And please stop with questions. And most of these comments are specific to the asset classes that the Community Foundation has in its portfolio, public equity, public fixed income, private equity, private real assets, really where we're going to spend our time. But if we think back to the years 2020, 2020 to 2023, and I can't believe it's been four years since the start of COVID. And as I think about it, because I still have young kids, that's the amount of time that my kids will be in high school and in college. They will be out of the house I will have turned the backyard rank into a deck extension. <laughs> I think I'm kidding about that. I have a bunch of two by 12s that are going to be just stacked up that I'll use for something else. But in, in 2020, uh, or right at the start of COVID, nominal growth experienced the most significant deceleration or collapse since the Great, uh, Great Depression in 2029, followed immediately by the most significant surge in nominal growth since the Korean War. And that was a span of over 20 years. And we experienced that in a span of about 20 months. And then that was followed by the most significant deceleration is the Federal Reserve and just a relaxing of the overall supply chain, brought inflation down from 9.1%, the highest level in 40 years, to right around, I think we're around 3%. That's your cue, Jack. What's the exact number? Do we know? 3.9 uh, inflation, right around 3%. Yeah. So we've experienced a lot in a very short period of time that's been driven by unexpected events. No one expected the global pandemic, and then no one really expected the magnitude of interest rate hikes that helped relax overall inflation. But obviously, that's had a significant impact on, on equity markets and fixed income markets. So just to illustrate the significant decline in inflation measured by the person, personal consumption expenditure of the Federal Reserve's key measure of inflation. Now, there's some variability here between core uh, and, 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 and PCE when we strip out more volatile sectors like energy and food. But the message is that we are trending towards that 2% level of inflation. The Federal Reserve has paused in all likelihood they are done with their interest rate hiking cycle, at least until they can digest the data. Now, their messaging around when interest rate cuts will start and what the market thinks will happen and what big banks think will happen is different. And it's been different the whole time. Um, and so this is the illustration of that path, right? The first interest rate hike occurred in March of 2022 with 25 basis points, followed by a 50 basis point hike. And then there were 10 consecutive rate increases, uh, a pause and then one more increase at the end of July, bringing the terminal rate to around five and a half percent. And by historical standards, when you think about uh, the early 80s, um, that, that's still a relatively low, not low, low number, but of course we were shocked by interest rates on mortgages, more volatility around interest rates, and that certainly creates uncertainty. It also creates opportunity in fixed income markets. And just as a side, and, and thinking again about my kids who are now old, actually not quite old enough to watch the first Ghostbusters movie <laughs> in the early '80s, and there are some definitely some inappropriate scenes where they're, you know, maybe six or seven, but they're talking about buying the firehouse where they end up setting up shop. And there's a scene with Dan Aykroyd and Bill Murray, and he's like, the interest rates on that alone are going to be 18%, which is hilarious. <laughs> yes, they have no idea what that means. But there was a time when interest rates were much, much higher. And so this is where we do see some deviation between what the Federal Reserve is suggesting 
and what the market expects. So everything in the gray or shaded where that line becomes dotted are the expectations of rate cuts at the Federal Reserve or the FOMC meeting, which are every every six weeks. Um, so the expectation is that we will see as many as six or seven 25 basis point rate reductions in 2024. Now, the likelihood of that increase of that happening increases if we encounter a recession. If we don't encounter a recession, there will probably be fewer. And that's part of the reason the disconnect. Most large banks, Marquette, et cetera, probably think there will be about three to four cuts, maybe a total reduction of 75 to 100 basis points is probably a little bit more realistic. But there could be something that happens that accelerates this process. The next few slides just sort of underscore the reasons that inflation has been softening. And it's not just because of higher interest rates, although that certainly helped, but just a relax, uh, relaxing in global supply chain pressures. I mean, it was very difficult to buy things, to ship things, to get things uh, because of the conflict in Ukraine, because of the global pandemic. And all of that helped elevate prices, a transition towards green energy. Uh, and not having the infrastructure to support it. All of that is an inflationary pressure that has abated somewhat. So the combination of higher interest rates uh, and, and, global, and relaxing of global supply chain has certainly helped alleviate some inflationary pressures. Job openings, there have been, in, in, at one point, there were as many as almost 12 million job openings, and that has come down to 8%. So we're trending back to an employer's market away from an employee market where they can demand, employees can demand higher wages. So we're trending back to a more normalized labor conditions, which is also bringing down wage growth. We saw a huge spike, we saw a huge drop, and now we are approaching a normalized wage condition. <laughs> And to the extent we see more normalization, that suggests more, uh, more realistic inflationary expectations and the likelihood that we will see a reversal in overall rates. Now, what are some of the uh, inflationary signals? And if we look out over the next, uh, next call it eight years or 10 years, there is a decline in the uh, growth of the working population. And much of that is attributable to baby boomers. And the first wave of baby boomers have exited the force. But there will be more and more an increase or a decrease in labor force participation as baby boomers exit. So fewer workers. Now, of course, in an unanticipated consequence or expectation is, is immigration or illegal immigration. There are more and more people that are coming to the United States to find work. And that's part of the reason that we've experienced very healthy economic growth, part of the reason that capitalism works. People come to the United States to find jobs. Now we look at these, these projections, but there are other things that are, that are in place, more people working, more people returning to the workforce that we don't necessarily capture here. But to me, this is probably one of the more concerning metrics. And what really has helped support the U.S. economy is very robust consumer spending. That represents about two-thirds of, of economic activity. The other is investment and then government spending, which is expected to be flat. American households have not curbed their spending habits, despite the fact that wages have come down, employer job openings have come down, they're still spending like it was 2021 on the back end of massive amounts of, of COVID stimulus. And they're funding that through credit card debt or revolving credit, credit card debt. And that is just not sustainable, especially when the annual percentage rate on or APR on credit card debt has gone from 14 to 19 or 20 percent, much more expensive. What we don't reflect here, but there's a change in student loans, uh, which also impacts overall discretionary spending. And this is just not sustainable. So at some point, this will reverse or we will see some level of bankruptcies. But this is the sign that suggests that maybe some of the spending is not as sustainable as, as, as we think. Uh, and just, you know, in terms of the overall global or the global climate, most major markets will experience some level of rate reduction. Emerging markets, and we'll talk about this a little bit later, were among, the, especially Latin American co uh, countries, were among the first to raise rates in response to inflation. As, as agrarian or commodity-linked uh, into our economies, they were among the first to feel that squeeze. They were among the first to raise rates, and they will ex they will most likely be among the first to reduce rates. Attractive opportunities in, in emerging markets, Latin American markets, but then across most of the developed and emerging market world, we will probably see 
some level of rate reductions, which creates opportunity, creates uncertainty. And then secondly, uh, 2024, there are 60 countries this year that will have some sort of significant national election. Now, uh, I think we're, we, especially here in Iowa, focused on politics, what the, what the implications are. And generally speaking, there is political tension all the time, geopolitical tension all the time. And we like to make educated guesses around what the implications will be for markets. Uh, but Jack and I were watching or, or reviewing some notes from JP Morgan around uh, economic or, uh, election cycles. And generally, who, what, whatever party has their president in power tends to have a favorable view on the economy. And the group that doesn't have their president in power has an unfavorable unfavorable view. So we look at these, think of ourselves, there can be some level of, of dislocation, but it really doesn't lead to any, any sort of observable trend. There is always some level of ter turmoil in uh, our election cycle in the U.S., but it's just interesting to note that 60 in one year is a lot. So we'll, we'll take a look at asset classes, fixed income, U.S. equity, non-U.S. equity, private equity, real estate. And, and, high, and this all of this is available if you'd like to see it, Kay, please feel free to pass it out. And we have a much more expansive market environment if you ever care to look at it. We'll but email, the, we'll email that out to everybody. Thanks. So, so key opportunities, and I've highlighted in blue, which ones I think are probably a little bit more interesting. Um, agency mortgage-backed securities. There's, there's interest rate volatility. Volatility creates inefficiencies. Inefficiencies create room to extract value. More agency mortgage-backed securities are part of the aggregate bond index. It's part of any sort of passive benchmark if you have uh, what's labeled as core fixed income. And your managers and your client portfolios undoubtedly are overweight mortgage-backed securities already because there is opportunity to shorten duration, shorten interest rate sensitivity, and capture higher yield. Of course, the, ri the risk in the marketplace is the Fed doesn't behave in any sort of rational way, at least according to our expectations. They raise or cut rates uh, at a rate that is unexpected, leading to just more turmoil in, in fixed income markets. To just illustrate performance for the year, uh, the year to date or the one year highlighted in blue, fixed income, investment grade fixed income at the very top, as you probably all know, rallied significantly. We saw the interest or the 10 year treasury increase by 110 basis points, only to decrease by 110 basis points and gave us positive return for the quarter for the year, avoiding three consecutive years of negative counting your return. Never happened. Towards the middle, whoops. There we go. This year to date column in the middle where we have high yield and senior secured loans, equity like performance, not surprisingly, these are below investment grade fixed income asset classes that tend to perform uh, in a way that's correlated to equity. So fixed income is a very attractive place to be. Fixed income should be an attractive place to be next year because yields are yields are more attractive. And just to illustrate that point. This is, you can sort of see it in the gray, but there is a range of yield uh, yields uh, since the inception of the respective benchmarks. So core fixed income or investment grade fixed income, senior secured loans, which has a duration of a quarter of a year, lots of movement with interest rates, <clears throat> high yield bonds and an emerging market debt in U.S. currency or in the respective local currency. And the key takeaway here is that core fixed income, investment grade fixed income, U.S. treasuries, is now yielding at the uh, very close to the all-time high and, and, and above the all-time average. And this is an asset class where there's very little risk, there tends to be very little volatility, but it's an asset class that now has a meaningful part in the portfolio. And for the foundation, for many of your client portfolios, you have fixed income for income generation and to serve as some sort of ballast. And that's been a very expensive trade over the course of the last decade because to buffer from economic downturn, the trade-off is, is basically zero, zero to 3%. The other key takeaways here are that yields are attractive for loans and high yield, still well below the all-time all -time highs, but much of that is attributable to the yields that we experienced following the global financial crisis. And then emerging market debt, we don't have a dedicated allocation to that within the portfolio, is, uh, is also attractive from a yield perspective. So what can we expect or what historically would have we observed during periods of Fed dovishness or reduction in rates? And generally speaking, whether it's across high yield levered loans or investment grade corporates, 
we've experienced attractive yields, attractive return across each one of the following uh, rate reduction cycles. And we're certainly on the doorstep of that. Another way of saying that in all likelihood, we should expect to see attractive performance from below investment grade and investment grade corporates, assuming that the Federal Reserve starts reducing rates. U.S. equities. Um, so where should the opportunities be? We saw a significant rally in just a handful of stocks referred to as the Magnificent Seven. This has been plastered all over the news, and I'm sure you've been talking to your clients about it. And how in the world could investors continue to pour more and more capital into very expensive names? Why don't they invest in cheaper, small cap stocks that have a, a more attractive valuation? So that is the expectation that more attractively priced stocks, small cap stocks that have been unloved for the better part of the last decade should experience a little bit more momentum, but that hasn't happened yet. But at some point we may see movement away from these large cap names, especially if these larger companies are confronted with more government interference, more regulatory pressures, and, uh, and more attention as it relates to antitrust. That's probably the biggest threat to some of these uh, larger companies. And then, of course, the risks, right? If we if we don't see a reduction in rates or if for some reason we see an increase in rates, that puts downward pressure on over, overall valuations. So technology stocks tend to be more uh, susceptible, more exposed to rising in rates, and we saw that in a little bit of a sell-off with those larger names in the second half of last year. <laughs> But across, you know, across the board, uh, performance was very strong. What is interesting in the year-to-date column, small cap equity did perform well in the last quarter. Uh, whether or not that rally is sustainable is in question. But over the long, over the trailing ten years, large cap was outpaced. Small cap, large cap growth outpaced small cap growth. And just an interesting aside, when we think about. We think about value versus growth. And I, how much of that or how much dialogue around growth versus value do you have with your clients? Is that an important part of the discussion or is just the exposure more important? Growth we have some, some, but not the person. Yeah, it's it's hard to get it right. Right. And in 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 the foundation, we've really kind of we, we removed value, large cap value from the portfolio following the last meeting, and we really have a core focus within the portfolio. And to put some, and, you know, if you follow Warren Buffett, a key value investor, you buy under underpriced or prices that are, or assets that are underpriced relative to their trading price, and you should gain value. Of course, the risk there is a value trap, and it's undervalued for a reason. But to put some numbers behind that, um, over the last 45 years, dating back to 1979, there have been 371 months where interest rates have been higher than 4%. And that's an environment where values, value companies perform well. And that was really kind of in the 10 to 20 years prior, or kind of the 80s to the early 90s. Uh, there have been 139 months where interest rates were below 3% and growth is outperformed. In fact, growth outperformed materially. And now uh, in an environment like the one right now, I'd call it three to 4% interest rates, 60 months where there's been no meaningful distinction between growth versus value. It's a very long-winded way of saying getting caught up in growth versus value bias is, is a difficult way to outperform and having a core allocation, especially in our interest rate environment, really, really is critical. Uh, just to illustrate again, the Magnificent Seven, and these, I think these names are names that we all know well, Alphabet, Amazon, the video, which is really one that we didn't expect, dominated overall themes. Um, and really was part of the reason that we saw such great return. The top 10 names in 2023 were up 62%. Uh, the bottom four names, or the rest of the, the remaining four names, were only up 8%, and the S&P 5 was up 26%. So we have a large concentration of just a handful of names, something that's certainly not sustainable. And there's a significant difference in the valuation of those of those stocks. The top 10 names are trading at 25% earnings, while the rest of the S&P 500, the remaining 400 names, are trading around 17%, more in line with what we would expect from small cap. Just really a, a point worth illustrating is it's it's difficult to sustain this type of performance, although the cash flow generation or the earnings growth generation 
much more attractive from these seven names compared to the remaining 493 names. And, and again, these seven names represent a significant portion of the S&P 5, the Russell 1000 growth, the NASDAQ, where we don't have a dedicated allocation to NASDAQ. That tends to be a technology heavy index. We balanced uh, this year, reducing the overall exposure, but seven names has a huge impact on the overall capitalization of each one of these respective indices. And then valuations, and there's so much that can influence valuations, interest rates in particular. But if we look at large cap stocks compared to small cap stocks, large cap stocks, not surprisingly, are, are more expensive and generally range in the 80th, 90th percentile relative to all time highs where small cap stocks are sort of right in the middle, much cheaper allocations. And the way that we now allocate across equities and the way that we encourage our clients to allocate is really by market capitalization. The Wilshire 5,000, the Russell 3,000 has roughly 90% allocated to large and mid, 10% allocated to small cap. Years and years ago, there was, there was a evidence of a small cap premium, smaller names, less, or, less frequently followed by institutional investors, fewer dollars that creates more inefficiencies. Those inefficiencies are largely gone and that small cap premium really has migrated to private equity. But it's very difficult to outperform or it has been over the last 20 years to outperform a bellwether in index by over allocating to small cap. Large cap has been a place to be even despite some of these differences in overall valuation. So another headwind for small cap companies, whoops, small cap companies tend to have more of their financing from floating rate debt. Floating rate debt tends to reset every quarter or uh, every, uh, every six months, meaning that higher interest rates would allow for more expensive debt servicing. So if we do see higher for longer, that will have a, it'll be a bigger headwind for small cap companies. And you can see really see that in the left-hand side. Uh, large cap stocks in aggregate only have about 6% of their debt in, in floating rate, whereas 38% of small cap companies finance their operations through floating rate debt. Higher for longer, much more significant debt burden compared to large cap companies. Now, of course, if we see a decline in interest rates, that is, a, that is favorable for small cap companies. So our tailwinds uh, are... What is the opportunity set for a rate reduction? And generally speaking, if we look at the average down at the bottom, uh, Fed cuts are accreted for U.S. equities on average from the final cut six months after, 12 months after. We have seen positive returns, and it's more impactful on the large cap space following a rate cut. Now, there, there are exceptions, notably uh, the, dot, the, the tech crisis and the global financial crisis. The depth of that sell-off was so long that we just didn't capture a significant rebound immediately following rate reductions. But generally speaking, lower interest rates, more attractive valuations, better for equity markets. So, of course, what is the impact on elections? And I, you know, I would argue that election cycles don't necessarily have a huge impact on, on stock market performance. What we can take away from this chart in the most recent elections dating back to 1984, with the exception of the global financial crisis, equities have performed well. But I think that's more attributable to the overall economic health of the U.S. economy during those years and less related to what actually happened with election cycles. But that's usually a question that's on the mind of investors. It's an interesting talking point, but I don't think I think this is probably more of a spurious correlation than anything else. But apart from you know one of the most significant economic downturns in the last you know hundred years, equity markets fare relatively well during election cycles. Non-US equity, um, with the exception of China, non-US equities performed reasonably well in 2023. The very top, and we talked about this a little bit already, Latin American countries, they are were among the first to raise rates are or will be among the first to reduce rates that creates an opportunity in equities. It's also interesting to point out the Japanese equity rebounded significantly this year, largely attributable to uh, regulatory reform in that marketplace, helping elevate a uh, stagnant equity market economy for the first time, first time in decades. We have a slide on that 
And of course, the risk, China, which represents around 8% of the overall uh, global market capitalization, 30% or so of the MSCI Emerging Market Index, has not been able to recover from COVID. The debt burden of years and years of real estate overdevelopment is, uh, is collapsing investor appetite for risk and basically slowing equity market returns. Uh, Chinese equity, I think, was down 22% in, in 2023, and they were they, the Chinese equity was down 22% in 2022, down 11% in 2023. By contrast, Japanese equity down 16% in 22, without 20% in 2023. Uh, there doesn't seem to be any sort of path forward to remove, for China to remove itself from the burden of this mounting real estate debt. And we've probably all seen the 60 minute episodes of these bridges to nowhere and cities without tenants. Uh, it certainly helps with economic development stimulus, but if you don't have actual people living in these cities, uh, it's, it's hard to create any sort of real economic growth. So in the, you know, similar story across the board, really with the exception of emerging markets, which were the laggard, but developed markets led by Japan in particular, performed reasonably well in a way that we think about equity allocation within client within the foundation and our broader client portfolios, again, follows market capitalization and approximately 60% of all equities traded in the world are traded in the United States. The remaining 40% are in uh, traded outside of the US and having that level of balance tends to work reasonably well. So uh, just a little bit more commentary on Japanese equity. And I think that you must have actually paying attention to what's happening in Japan, this is probably a little bit of a surprise, but there are uh, incentives now in place for households and pensions to hold more equities. There are 50 activist funds that are actively engaging the government corporations for some sort of regulatory reform. And the Tokyo Stock Exchange is threatening to delist companies where those companies are trading below book value. And all of that has had a significant impact on Japanese equity market performance. Uh, you know, the economy seems to be opening itself up. I was there 20 years ago, uh, and there is absolutely no sign of anybody other than somebody that was born in Japan, unlike the rest of Southeast Asia, where it's a very uh, heterogeneous culture, right? Japanese, uh, Japanese marketplace historically has been very, very uh, closed. Fewer women in the workforce, no immigration. That seems to be changing a little bit, which helps stimulate economic activity in Japan. So, and just an illustration on the following slide, um, you know, the EM index compared to China. China has certainly been a laggard over the past few years. And, and you know, prior to that, China was a key driver of, of growth in the region. Um, but now I, I think we've, we've always sort of wondered how reasonable, how accurate has that data been and how, you know, how real has that economic development really been? And I think this sort of answers part of that question. All of this development has been fun funded by government debt or funded by debt and is just no longer being supported by true economic activity. And we think more about companies that have benefited from Chinese dislocation or onshoring trends, especially following COVID, Mexico in particular, Vietnam, South Korea, in, you know, which, which has taken over a lot of the manufacturing as China has seen an exodus of manufacturers have performed significantly well, starting with uh, starting around the, the onset of COVID. And then another key driver of overall uh, equity performance has been currency. The U.S. and this almost directly corresponds with the yield in the 10 year Treasury. Um, we saw. You know, is so basically this is a, an illustration of foreign currency relative to the U.S. dollar. We saw a decline or an increase in U.S. Treasuries or the 10 yield on the 10 year right around mid year. Higher interest rates, more dollars flowed in the United States. Dollars or currencies leaving international markets create some decline in, in foreign currencies, and then we started to see a drop or a 110 basis point drop in the 10 year uh, right around the start of fall. And so dollars flowed away from the U.S. back into a basket of international currencies and higher currency valuations lead to more attractive return for U.S.-based investors. Part of the reason we see more volatility in, in non-U.S. equity. Inflation across the globe generally coming down, the, the, that faint uh, bar illustrates kind of that high point. And now we are, or the peak since 19, 
clearly trending back in the right direction, similar to what we're experiencing in the United States. Uh, but we can see Brazil, Mexico in particular, have experienced a more significant pullback, higher rates earlier on, controlling inflation earlier on. And just again, the trend in, in interest rates is expected to follow what we're seeing in the United States. Uh, Japan, of course, has a very low implied rate, but everywhere else we're starting to see an inflection point. Lower rates should be stimulative for overall economic growth, stimulative for equity market performance. <laughs> so real estate, and we, we downsized the real estate allocation of the foundation. That was a very healthy complement to an underwhelming bond portfolio for the better part of the last decade. We took that up to about 15%. We've since taken that down from 15 to 10 and allocated the infrastructure. And when we're speaking about real estate, we're speaking about a very specific type of real estate referred to core open-ended real estate focused on four key property types, industrial, office, retail, multifamily, in America's largest cities. Um, the opportunity of, among those four sectors, housing, there's a lot of volatility in mortgage rates, difficult to own homes. Many uh, Gen Zers and newer generations are not buying homes, they're moving into multifamily units in America's biggest cities. And that certainly has been an area of resiliency. By contrast, I think everybody well aware of this, you know, the challenges associated with growing debt costs in the office space in particular, vacancy rates in, in, in major markets, Chicago, Minneapolis, uh, just have not recovered and in all likelihood this hybrid work arrangement, even though the upper hand is favoring or is trending back towards employers, difficult to get people back in the office. And it's not maybe it's not a practical way to work. So it overall, and just speaking with principal just recently, a real estate uh, firm here in Des Moines, their lease negotiation or renegotiation is generally 25% lower square footage space less space required to support most companies now. Uh, and that trend will probably follow. When we think about inflection points in past years, real estate has rebounded. You know, buying low, buying at that dip has led to great results. This is a structural change in the way that American workers are accessing office space. And we're also, what we're also experiencing here is very similar to real estate following the global financial crisis. Real estate is not put, this type of real estate, not publicly traded. Uh, fewer transactions, transactions take much longer. So following the global financial crisis, investors dumped their risky assets equity uh, and they couldn't dump real estate. But over a period of time, say 12 to 24 months, we saw fewer, uh, fewer purchases, uh, fewer comparables, wider bid ask spread, all of that put downward pressure on real estate. We're experiencing that now. Real estate was, one of the best performing asset classes in 20, 2022, and one of the only negative performing asset classes in 2023, identical to what happened during the global financial crisis. The big difference this time, what happens in office. It is also interesting to observe, and we, we look at the knee creep odyssey as a bellwether benchmark for core cool real estate. We've seen, we, you know, not surprisingly, we've seen a compression in valuation, fewer comparables, difficult to value assets, but the income component is very consistent. Over the trailing 10 years, the rent associated with fully occupied or near fully occupied buildings with tenants paying their rents has led to a, you know, a, healthy, a healthy yield, much more attractive than what we've seen from bonds. So we have a healthy yield. We have on average appreciation that's, that's consistent with the overall level of inflation, call it 3%. That leads to uh, a total return of around 7 to 8%. So despite these dips, which are inevitable, we still see attractive return from just core real estate. And a key tenant of core real estate, low levels of leverage below, call it 22%, in buildings that are nearly fully occupied, occupancy levels of most core buildings or properties, whether they're industrial, retail, multifamily, or office, still hover around 90%. So they are occupied by tenants. And Class A properties still attract uh, very... Class A um, office properties still attract tenants. It's those urban core built before 1990 uh, where it's going to be very difficult for those properties to recover. And the amount of assets that are built or office buildings that were built before 1990 is absolutely staggering. And I'm not sure how they get repurposed, but I was at another meeting in Des Moines uh, talking to an executive director and his solution is urban farming. And, and maybe there is some 
uh, some reality to that, right? Especially in, in urban centers, increasing migrant populations, lower wastewater, recycling, fertilizer, maybe that could work and maybe that's one of these exogenous impacts that could have an impact in overall property. You heard it here first in 2024. For, we're, we're saying pickle on course. Pickle on course, yes, exactly. Um, vacancies, not surprisingly, among these four types are the highest for office, the lowest for industrial, and the industrial, you know, primarily warehouses to support just in time inventory, the Amazon effect. Many of these, and we see these all the time, right? They're being built right off of, you know, America's interstate system, so they can be very close to the end user. Uh, there probably is a little bit of a risk of oversupply, but those vacancy rates are very, very low. Uh, the vacancy rates for office very high. And for years and years, that was the argument in favor of core open end real estate. America's cities are resilient. They have access to high, you know, talented people, ports, airports, education systems. And that was a great way to add value. But I was in San Francisco last week, uh, and that's a market that's collapsed. It's, you know, it's the perception that it's dangerous. Yes, sir. I just being interrupted. Sorry. Sorry. Um, does this core open ended real estate include things like data centers? It, you, well, so it's another interesting point. It usually does not. What we're starting, actually, let me see if there's I've got this slide here. So these are the four main property types. Um, and at the very top, that is industrial. We see a significant downward trend in office, which used to be a, which used to be the highest at 36%. And then we see an increase in other to about 9.2%. And the way that the Odyssey is constructed, it's an aggregation of all, say, 25 different core open-ended managers. Included in that other are data centers life sciences, student housing, senior and assisted living. Um, and the reason that we're starting to see more of that is we're left with a very concentrated portfolio. If you used to open a, hold a core fund, you're overexposed now really to industrial and multifamily. Retail is trending slightly upward. So I think the bigger question is, will we see a redefinition of how core open-end managers define their property types as data centers become more important, life science centers become more important? And I think the answer has to be yes, right? Otherwise, we're left with a very concentrated suite of portfolio. I don't even think about an aging population too, baby boomers and things like that kind of seems to be a higher demand as well, right? Absolutely. Yeah. And investors aren't gonna wanna pay for just you know these, these types of properties. And data centers are becoming more and more important, as are, you know, hotels are included in this at a very short duration. Um, but there, there's a lot happening in the real estate space that's, that's, you know, concerning, but it also creates opportunity. You know, retail, which was, all you know, all but dead just from a, a little less than a decade ago, we're starting to see some level of resiliency, especially around grocery anchored property, experiential properties. Uh, smaller footprints, people no longer have a desire to go to a mall, but they still want to touch a product. They still want to see a product. A great example of that for all you dad travelers, Johnston and Murphy. Yeah, they're in airports. They're super small, but you can go in there. You can try something on. You can see it. You can feel it. And you order it online. And that's the extent of my shopping here, right? <laughs> but, it, but that's a good example of the way that retail is trending. It, it, it's easy for that particular consumer. It's a small footprint. They have very limited inventory, but they usually have a very wide selection, so you can at least view it. Do you have a Johnson, you have a Johnson and Murphy question? <laughs> <laughs> They'll ship it to wherever you want. Uh, you were saying something about San Francisco. Oh, yeah, so San Francisco is super interesting. And... Well, and I was in Portland over the summer, and the situation is on the ground is as bad as it appears in the news. I mean, as it turns out, deregulizing or decriminalizing hard drug use was a terrible idea because that is that is part of uh, sort of everyday life in downtown, and, and tenants are leaving. But it was interesting about San Francisco. So every year around the first week, J.P. Morgan holds, and they've been doing this for 43 years, their healthcare conference, which is one of the largest healthcare conferences in the United States. Uh, and last year, tents were everywhere, definitely felt a little unsafe, looked unsightly. And then this year, 
it was in tenants, tenants have left. I mean, some of the some of the most prolific uh, retail stores, Whole Foods, they have all they've all vacated. But it was much cleaner. There was no sign, at least in the area where I was, Union Square, the Embarcadero, which is the financial district of of tents and homelessness. But of course, Xi Jinping was there in October. There was a huge conference, an epic conference, and the JP Morgan conference. He's just talking to my Uber driver, which is where I get most of my information. <laughs> uh, but they, they are on the ground. They're very aware. He said in a matter of days, it was gone. And I said, well, where did everybody go? And he had no idea. But it's amazing how quickly governments can make these changes if they absolutely need to. And it's also just interesting to observe how devastating that can be to the taxpayer base. And if some of these cities don't find their way out of this mess, it's going to have a significant and probably prolonged impact on real estate in those markets. And Chicago is not immune to that. Chicago hasn't recovered. I'm not sure what the vacancy rates are. But a bigger problem for Chicago, these core cities or these core buildings in the loop um, are losing tenants to the brand new shiny buildings. And there are literally probably eight that are built on the north and west corner of the river, River North, River West, the Fulton Market District, which, which is the hot area. And they're all, they all look the same. They're shiny, they're glassy, but they've attracted all the, all the best tenants out of this urban, urban core. And you're not going to see a backfill. I just, I can't, I can't envision how that's going to be backfilled in this you know, traditional, you know, traditional market. And I think that's a problem for a lot of cities. Minneapolis is, is desolate and they have that sort of, it's the Pedway, the Skyway. There's no retail track, and those are relatively small markets to begin with. Um, let's see. Why don't we just so another point that's worth illustrating? So over the last 24 years, and these are calendar year returns of the Neat Creek Odyssey. There have only been three that have produced negative calendar year returns. The income is usually consistent. The value appreciation is usually consistent with overall inflation. There have been, and most of the returns range from five to 15%, but over the last 24 years, only three instances of negative calendar year return gives us some reassurance as a real estate investor. And of course, there are periods of recovery, whether it was the early 90s, the tech crash, the financial crisis, Real estate tends to recover. But in the back of our minds, what is different with office this time? Uh, and then finally, private equity. And, and private equity tends to follow public equity in terms of comparables and valuations. And the way that we, the foundation, invests in private equity, we are investors primarily in small buyout. And there are hundreds of thousands of companies in the United States that are, you know, that have EBITDA less than $25 million. There is an unlimited supply because of our, our, our system of capitalism where money flows to ideas or to founders that build businesses. So there's plenty of opportunity to invest in a business with a private equity sponsor that can create management teams, better financial arrangements, better marketing, better distribution, help grow these companies so they can be sold to a strategic buyer or another private equity sponsor. There is great opportunity in, in the buyout space, relative value opportunities in the buyout space, still trading below public market valuations. That's opportunity for the foundation. The risks, which are not risks for us, these larger market mega cap private equity companies that have sucked all of the value out, that are now massively expensive, <laughs> very difficult to extract value or to find some sort of exit. We think about the allocation that we have to private equity with the foundation, 15%. Uh, we're writing relatively small checks to buy small companies or to invest in small companies. Iowa PERS, CalPERS, uh, hundreds of billions of dollars in capital trying to find private equity deals. That's a risk for those investors because to put that money to work, they have to buy big companies with lofty valuations that really don't have a path to exit. And those are the those are the types of companies that tend to capture the negative headline noise in the private equity space. Massive valuations. That's not an issue for us. That's not how the foundation invests for the most part. Uh, and really, when we look across, and so why do we have private equity in the portfolio? There are inefficiencies. There is room to build businesses, to improve businesses, and the return to the top uh, global buyout, U.S. buyout. Over the trailing uh, ten-year period, his his outperformed immediately. You know, three hundred, four hundred days.
uh, but there's been less deployment, less fewer transactions, less opportunity, but that also creates, that creates uh, opportunity. We see valuations starting to decline from a peak. And this is also part of the reason that we want to have vintage year diversification. Very difficult to time markets, even harder to time uh, private equity markets. And we saw a rise in valuation all the way up until about 2021. And that's coming back down, which is why we try to put money to work in the foundation every single year. So I'll leave with this. And you know, Jack and I listened to or watch, read a number of different projections, BlackRock, Goldman Sachs, JP Morgan. I mean, there are hundreds of these things that we can listen to, and each one has slightly different sound bites. And the one that I like the best, how to remember the forecast for 2024. So two, so 2024, two, two percent growth. We still should see, despite all the rate cut, the rate rate hikes. 2% growth in the US, 0% chance of inflation, 2% uh, inflation by the end of the year, and less than 4% unemployment. So 2024. <laughs> and I think we should go back and watch this video a year. <laughs> I just one and other, one other point that I forgot to mention, I thought that was interesting. So unemployment has also been very, very low. We have a very healthy uh, labor force in the United States. And there have been 25 consecutive months of unemployment below 4%. That hasn't happened since 1969. So low, low unemployment, unemployment, unemployment below 4% is part of the reason that the U.S. economy has been so resilient. That in most American households who finance their, their mortgage at a very attractive rate, so the debt burden is very low. Corporations have are still flush with cash and have low levels of debt. All of that is part of the reason we haven't experienced a recession yet. So what's on your mind? Did I cover everything? Everything? Hey, could you elaborate just a little bit more on the, the topic of Japan? And, and I'm sure it's complicated, but at a high level, what really went on that they could adjust things with the way their stock exchange works to deal with governance to increase profit, profitability to increase value? Yeah, so... And, Probably the best way to sum it up is just encouraging um, uh, pensions and households to just buy more Japanese stock. Uh, so when you buy more, that just boosts prices. But the Tokyo Stock Exchange has either threatened to or is delisting companies that are trading below book value. Uh, so sort of stagnant companies. Uh, the pen, most of the pension schemes in Japan invest in Japanese government debt. Part of and. and Japan is the most indebted country in the world, which doesn't make it. That's kind of an unfair metric. It's just because the pension schemes are buying Japanese government debt. And part of that's a, a national function, not buying enough equity. Um, and then there's incentives. And I don't know the details around these incentives, but incentives are in place for pensions and households to purchase Japanese equity, take money away from Japanese government bonds and invest in Japanese companies. And there are now 50 activist funds, which is the most in history, that are either confronting uh, corporations or government to Im impose more regulatory reform, maybe around transparency. But it's another way to just get more investors active in Japanese equity markets. And I think it's just a, a recognition that it's been too stagnant for too long and regulatory reform works. D list means they're just no longer in the population. They won't be. They, they won't possible. be publicly traded. Yeah. Okay. Just remove. But the the other observation here that is that cr can create a pop. That's not sustainable, right? Um, so I, who knows how long that will last? Maybe that leads to companies. You know, if you're threatened to be delisted, maybe you have companies that are more innovative. They invest in their company. They pay shareholder dividend. I mean, I think the impression is getting some kind of kick in the pants. <laughs> And, you know, in the Japanese market, in, in, I was there, in, I lived in Singapore in 2004, and I went up to visit, visit a buddy uh, who, had just gra who had just graduated from Wharton, and we went and saw him for a weekend. And everybody looks the same. I mean, everybody is Japanese. It st I stood out like a sore thumb. That is not the way, that is not the case in the rest of, of Southeast Asia. I mean, very open societies, lots of immigration capitalism works and that sort of closed structure just is is part of the reason that they've experienced such significant stagflation not having an open immigration policy 
having too few women in the workforce, all of that just leads to sort of economic malaise. And I think that that's loosening a little bit. Kind of going back to uh, real estate and personal consumption. I know we don't have exposure to single family real estate, but with mortgage rates higher, the journal recently had a story about, you know, it's more economical to rent now than buy. What's the effect on, I mean, you already highlighted some of the risks of personal consumption and, and, and debt and things like that. Does that offset that in any way if they're not taking on housing debt or is their expenditures higher in the rental market or what do you see with that? Yeah, so, so the, so some core open end real estate managers are venturing into single family homes. JP Morgan is, I mean, it's not a size of a piece of the portfolio. Most of the multifamily homes or multifamily units think about one roof, multiple units, same infrastructure, as opposed to a standalone house. Much more efficient to operate an apartment building than it is a standalone home because you have one roof, one basement, and all the equipment's the same. Uh, but to your point, there is more interest among families, households, individuals to live in a single family home and rent that versus uh, a multifamily. So we are starting to see instances of that primarily kind of in the southeast. Uh, but in general, folks, young people in particular who want to be in, or in urban centers, uh, they will need a place to live. And if there's higher mortgage expense, higher you know down payments following the global financial crisis, non-existent. Now that's 20% or more, that is prohibited for some people to buy homes and they will need uh, multifamily units in general and in the core open end space. These tend to be, you know, class B, class A, higher, uh, higher end units where most people have the income and can afford to live in those units. Where we would see more in kind of the distressed space, which is not how the foundation is investing in real estate lower income, middle income, uh, peripheral, secondary, tertiary cities. And that creates opportunity too, but that's not how the foundation is best in the state. We had a conversation a few years ago. It might've been at a bar that was previously mentioned. Plus we were doing our currencies. We do our best work, Scott. Yes, it is. Yeah. Uh, what do you got going after the committee meeting? Yeah, let's go, <laughs> Harry's. So the SEC came out recently and uh, this seems like it's opened the door a little bit, uh, or maybe they just cracked open the door with currency use and gaps and such. Can you speak to that? Yeah, so it's certain that might have on our conversation going forward. Yeah, so the specific instance that Scott is mentioning, this was probably in 2021, I think it was during COVID, it was at Harry. Harry. Yeah. And this uh, younger guy offered to buy me a beer and he was bragging about his his success in the crypto and he handed me uh, an old style or something. He's like, here you go, old man. One of the most insulting things I've ever heard. <laughs> anyway, uh, shortly thereafter, crypto sort of collapsed. And, and crypto is, is it, we don't spend any time on it. We don't recommend it to any of our clients. I don't have any personal interest in it. And it's a, it's a fictitious asset in, invented for the sole purpose of trading, right? Now, things could evolve, the technology could be worth something, but certainly the collapse of FTX, Sam Bankman, Freed, Binance, that is an indictment of the, the crypto industry. The fact that the SEC, it, it, we can't, futures are available on crypto. There is some sort of institutionalized and regulated trading, but obviously this is a step in the right direction of applying the right level of regulatory oversight and SEC registered investment. Now, is this appropriate for an investor? In my humble opinion, absolutely not. We don't invest in currencies. We don't invest in commodities. Those are two, and, and cryptocurrency is a fictitious currency. We don't allocate to currencies and to commodities because they're so difficult to value. Every single asset in the portfolio, probably every single asset in your client portfolio has some sort of cash flow that can be discounted at a weighted average cost of capital, and you know how much it's worth. Currencies, commodities, and cryptocurrencies are only valued based on the, the overall supply and demand. So I have the short answer to your question though, Scott, more oversight, more acceptance, more dollars will flow in. So I think this will probably help elevate and stabilize the price. I still, I still wouldn't touch it. I'm an old style. Yeah, I, yeah, I'd really have an old style and have some kid call me an old man. <laughs> Well, 
Um, any other last minute questions? Otherwise, we'll move on. Thank you very yeah. much, Dave. Well, I enjoyed doing it.